This week we are starting a new series called Redeem the Screen. Redeem, of course, is this idea of taking something that is broken and seeing it turned into something beautiful. It's probably my favorite thing about God. He can redeem anyone, he can redeem anything, any situation or circumstance. It's one of my favorite things about being a pastor is getting a front row seat to watch God do his redeeming work in the lives of people. My prayer is that this is what God would do for our screens. You might think it's a bit unusual to spend three weeks talking about screens. Because I mean, what does the Bible have to say about our phones and our iPads and televisions? What do the ancient scriptures really have to say about such a modern phenomenon? But I hope one of the things you'll see as we study this together is this is one of the supernatural pieces of God's word is that it can speak into different areas of our lives that maybe we don't necessarily expect it to. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans 12. That's where we're gonna be studying the next three weeks. Or if you have a Bible app on your screen, you can go ahead and open that. Romans chapter 12, the next three weeks. We're gonna learn to look at our screens through this lens of Romans 12. It's, a, it's amazing how quickly things have changed in this area, how quickly screens have become central in our lives. So I was talking to um, one of my daughters about what things, what things were like in the old days. And I was saying that we didn't have cell phones. Like we didn't carry our phones around with us. We had phones, but they were on the wall in our homes. And I was telling her that those phones didn't have screens, so we couldn't FaceTime or text. And she's trying to wrap her mind around what that would have been like. And, and she said, well, if they didn't have a screen, how did you know who was calling? <laughs> I'm like, we didn't. And she said, wait, you mean the phone would ring and then you would answer it without knowing who was on the other line? All the time. <laughs> like that's how we lived. And I just saw in her eyes this look. I mean, she was appalled. It reminded me of when my grandmother was telling me about going out to the outhouse in the winter. And my, I just can't imagine that we ever lived like that as people, right? And that's how it is when you try to describe to your teenagers about what life was like before screens. A lot has changed and a lot has changed quickly. I, I was telling my son who's a, a freshman in high school that when I was his age, that's when the first website came out, like first ever website. Now, we didn't have internet. No one I knew had internet for several more years after that, but, but now there are more than two billion websites. In 1998, the word Google became a word. It had not been used before 1998. Today, like just today, there will be 10 billion Google searches. 15% of those searches will be first time ever searches. Nobody has ever searched for 15% of those today. 2007, the iPhone was released and then you had a number of um, smartphones that were released after that. Now, almost everybody has a smartphone. In fact, if you don't have your phone with you, you can be clinically diagnosed as having a legitimate form of an, of an anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorder. So we're on our phones all the time. That can be dangerous. And sometimes it can like literally, not just metaphorically or emotionally or relationally be dangerous. Like it can be literally dangerous. Take a look at this video.
I don't know why, but it, I just enjoy coming to church and laughing at other people's expense. Like, I know that's part of my fallen nature, but it's therapeutic. And most of us can relate to this. Like, we understand that it's dangerous how much we're on our phones. But, but as we'll talk about in the series, there is a danger in what it does to us emotionally, what it does to us relationally, what it does spiritually. We're going to talk about how, even though it feels like it's something that connects us, that in reality, it can disconnect us with other people, it can disconnect us with God, and it can disconnect us with ourselves. But the series is Redeem the Screen because I believe that God wants to take this technology and use it for good in our lives and in the lives of others, that it can also be used to teach us, to inspire us. It can be used to disciple us, and that's our prayer, is that as a church we would learn to better leverage this technology so that we can connect more people to Jesus and to one another. So we're gonna be studying Romans 12 to help us with this. I wanna give you a quick example of how it can be redeemed. It came from um, my Facebook page this past week. I, I posted something about my sermon from, from pa- this past weekend and a, and a man posted in response to it on my Facebook page. He said, so here I am scrolling through Facebook, having a drink at a bar after leaving a lawyer's office and getting ready to fall in the hole over child support. Along with that, my girlfriend of almost three years decided she didn't want to have anything to do with me. After weeks of trying and trying and counseling sessions, I've grown to be afraid of what the new day might bring. I have this overwhelming anxiety. I feel like my life is crashing. I have no clue how to deal, no family near and no friends near. She was my best friend. When I saw this post, I literally cried here at the bar. But after reading this, I know God is there. I know I need to learn how to leave some things in his hands. I'm trying. And so you see a way that God can redeem a screen so that his word reaches the right person at just the right time, goes to him right where he's at. He didn't come to church. Just scrolling through, somebody posted something, and it spoke to him in a way that he really needed. So we're going to look at Romans 12. Let's start in verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. So Paul's gonna challenge us to honor God with every area of our lives, including our screens. But what's the motivation? Well, this is how Paul doesn't start off. He doesn't start off and say, well, in in view of God's wrath, because God is angry all the time, you really ought to think about honoring him in this area of your life. He doesn't say, "In, in view of God's harshness, and he's just always, always in a bad mood. And because he's such a harsh God, you, you really need to change some of your habits and some of your behaviors. He doesn't say in, in view of God's tyranny because he's a control freak who always has to have everything his way and you better, you better line up. Now that, that's not the, the motivation and yet here's what I know is that many of us grew up in churches when we talked about things like screens, any kind of behavior modification really, Fear and guilt, were he- those weapons were heavily used. That I'm gonna change your behavior by making you feel scared or making you feel guilty. And, and yet what I can tell you is that using fear and guilt as a way to change behavior is not very effective. It tends to result in either rebellion or worse, or worse, self-righteousness, right? And, and so take a breath. If you hear that we're gonna preach for you know, three weeks on screen, some of you are thinking, great, three, a three-week guilt trip, and woe to the person whose phone might go off during one of these sermons. Like, if, if you think that's gonna be the tone of this series, now I, I wanna ask you to, to give, us, give us a chance to talk through this a little bit differently than you might be expecting. When I was in high school, uh, we didn't have cell phones or the internet, but we did have, we did have rock and roll. Right. So we, this was the days of Def Leppard and, and Iron Maiden and Kiss. I, was more, I wasn't really into the hard rock scene. I was more into like uh, Bon Jovi and LL Cool J. And um, <laughs> don't call it a comeback. And so 
If you know, you know. And so I, I, that was more the scene that I was into, but I remember this sermon series in our youth group where we talked about the dangers of rock and roll music, and, and the series was called <clears throat> Hell's Bells. Hell's Bells. <laughs> because this was gonna be the music that was played in hell. And so they were warning us about not listening to this music because this is the music that was gonna be played in hell. That was kind of the idea, I think, of the series. I think it kind of backfired. Like, at least some of my friends were like, wait, they're gonna play music like this in hell? Like, it, it, didn't, it didn't really have the effect that they were hoping for. But in this series, they, there's a lot of fear and guilt that was used to try and get us as high school students to, to you know, line up. And so they were telling us, you know, that if this rock and roll music, if you played the music backwards, that there were hidden satanic messages. Do you remember this? How many of you remember this? <laughs> awesome, okay. It was called backmasking, if you remember. And so the idea was, you know, if you, like for example, there was an Ozzy Osbourne album that if you, if you played it backwards, it was supposed to say, you know, here's to my sweet Satan. If, you're supposed to be able to hear that if you played it backwards, which is scary. But if you played it forward, you would have to listen to Ozzy Osbourne sing. And that's scarier. So it was like, I don't know, maybe. And, and so that was kind of the tone of this series. Uh, they were telling us things like, you know, that Kiss stood for Knights in Satan's service. You remember this? And if that's what you listen to, then that's who you are. And that's not what it stood for, right? Like they just, they liked the name because it was simple and it was recognized worldwide, worldwide but that's the kind of thing that was used to try to get us as high school students to change our behavior. And what I remember about that series is week two, being in my buddy's basement because he bought an Ozzy Osbourne record and we were gonna try to listen to it backwards and find out those messages for ourselves, right? This is my point, that using fear and guilt as a way to change someone's behavior, it tends to lead to, to rebellion or it leads to legalism and self-righteousness, which is worse. I'd much rather deal with a rebellious spirit than a legalistic and self-righteous one, somebody who follows all the rules and then looks at other people judgmentally because, hey, I don't listen to that music, but you do. That makes me better. I'd rather have the rebellion. It just doesn't work, though. Fear, fear and guilt doesn't work. So what's the motivation, then? What's our motivation for thinking about how to honor God with this area of our lives? Well, what's Paul say? He says, in view of God's what? In view of God's mercy, because God has been so loving and kind and gracious to you because of that, let me talk to you about some things that are pretty personal. Because of how God has demonstrated his love to you, I, I wanna address some areas of your life that you might feel a little bit defensive about initially. And so in Romans, this is what he's been doing. He's talking about the mercy and the grace of God. Romans three, we read, that we're all sinners, every single one of us. Romans six, though, we read of God's mercy that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Romans eight, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because of God's mercy. And then you look at verse 38 and 39 of Romans eight. Paul writes, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, in view of that, in view of God's love and mercy, let me challenge you to align this area of your life in such a way that God is honored, in such a way that is holy and pleasing to him. And so, so Paul says that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. The word living is important. That's not the state of most sacrifices. And Paul's making the case that your life, your whole life is meant to be a sacrifice on the altar, that this, how you live, is an act of worship. The, the message paraphrases it like this. It says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, eating, going to work, life. You're walking around, life. I might add, your screen, life. And place it before God on the altar as an offering. 
In, in view of God's mercy, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take every area of your life and set it on the altar and say, God, this, this is yours. You have jurisdiction over this. That, that what I say and what I do and what I see and what I listen to and what I think about, it's, it's, all, it's all for you. I want it to honor you. And so th- this is where we begin our discussion about screens. For the record, this is where we would begin a discussion about money. This is where we would begin a discussion about sexuality, about any area of your life that just seems very personal and off limits. We begin with an understanding that it is not off limits if you are a follower of Jesus. That when you decide to follow him, you are giving him your life. I was reading this practice um, that was done by the church in the medieval era where they would baptize the, the knights of Templar and they would allow the knights to be baptized with their sword before going into war. When they were baptized with their sword, they would be immersed in the water, but they'd hold, up, they'd hold their sword up out of the water as a way to say, hey, this is off limits. Like what I do on the battlefield, what I do with this sword, like that's not part of the deal. And, and I think today, if we carried out this practice, that for some of us, that's how we'd get baptized. We get baptized, but I got my phone up out of the water, going under, phone stays up, because this isn't part of the deal, like who I am online, and what I do on my phone, and what shows I watch on Netflix, that's not part of the deal. And Paul says, no, it is. It's part of the deal. We, we are to offer all of ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. Verse two, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, this word conform uh, literally means to form according to a mold, a mold. J.B. Phillips paraphrases it. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. And so you picture a mold, and Paul's saying, don't just fit in without thinking about it. Don't be conformed. Don't just go along with whatever the mold of your culture is. Uh, a few years ago, my wife, we're not sure who gave, who gave them to her, but my wife was given these Christmas cookie molds. And you know, there's like Christmas trees, candy canes and such. And, and so we were, the next year, using these Christmas cookie molds to make cookies for our neighbors, kind of getting in the spirit of things. And, and one of these molds just didn't, didn't look familiar to me. Like I just didn't recognize what it might be. And, and I started looking at it more closely. <laughs> Some of you know. <laughs> Some of you are Christians, but like, hey. <laughs> I, I will say, I will say, like the 1115 service knew more than all the others. So <laughs> I, I will say that. What you're looking at here is a marijuana mold, right? <laughs> Got the pastor and his family making marijuana Christmas cookies <laughs> for all the neighbors, celebrating the birth of Jesus that way. Now, we, we didn't know what we were looking at, at least not initially, like, it wasn't intentional, it was just a mold. We're just making cookies. But whether it was our intention or not, that was the mold. That's, that was the shape that the cookies came out in. This is the idea that Paul is getting at here. It's like there's this mold that we have in our culture, and you might not mean to just fit into it. You might not want that to necessarily dictate your life and your family and your relationships, but guess what? Unless you're intentional to do something different, that will be your life. You will fit into that mold. You will be conformed to the pattern of this world. That your thinking will match up with everyone else's thinking and your beliefs will match up with their beliefs and what you think is right and wrong will match up with what everyone else seems to be thinking is right and wrong at the moment. So Paul says don't conform to the pattern of this world and he he says but be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So he parallels these words. This word transformed is the word metamorpho, which we get our word metamorphosis. So you kind of go back to elementary school where you're learning about the caterpillar becoming a butterfly, and, and that's what this is, that it's something that has become full of life and beauty. So he says, 
Be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. And New Living Translation puts it by changing the way you think. So you're either gonna be conformed to the pattern of this world or you're gonna change the way you think, meaning that you're gonna think differently than the way you've been thinking. You're gonna think differently than the way everybody else is thinking. You're gonna change your thinking so that you can be, so that you can be transformed. There's a, uh, a law in psychology, it's called the, the law of cognition. And um, simply defined, the law of cognition would say that whatever you think about determines your life. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. And for maybe the last 50 years or so, the most, easily the most dominant movement in American psychology would be cognitive psychology. There's another law in psychology, it's called the law of exposure. And the law of exposure says that what you think about is determined by what you're exposed to the most. So your life is shaped by your thoughts and your thoughts are determined by whatever you're exposed to the most. So let's kind of put these together. This is what you would have, is that your life is shaped by your thoughts and you think about whatever you're exposed to the most. So whatever you're exposing yourself to the most is going to determine what you think about and then what you think about is going to shape your life, determine your attitude, give direction to your relationships. It, it all comes back to the way you're thinking. And so Paul says, look, the way you think is gonna determine whether you're being conformed or whether you're being transformed. And so if I could just put this together in a little equation to help us out, is that the amount of time, law of exposure, and the type of content, what I'm exposing myself to, equals whether I'm gonna be conformed or I'm gonna be transformed. Now, if this is true, and I believe it is, then this has incredible, incredible implications on how we use our screens. Now, whether we want it to or not, whether we mean for it to or not, it's what we're exposed to, and as we're exposed to it, it's what we think about, what we think about that determines our lives. So, go back to verse one. Paul gives us a filter here that we can use. We're used to filters with our screens, he gives us a filter to help us use our screens in a way that will transform us instead of conform us. So he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So what's the filter? Is it holy and is it pleasing to God? That's the filter. Is it holy and is it pleasing to God? Now look, I'll tell you, that's, that filter's a little strict for me. Like, I wish the filter was, is it wicked and offensive to God? Because I don't mind staying away from things that are wicked and offensive to God. That's not the filter. The filter is, is it holy and pleasing to God? That's a much more challenging filter. And so in the next couple weeks, we're gonna spend quite a bit of time talking about the type of content that we have access to on our screens and the impact it has on us and our relationships with others, our relationship with God. We'll talk to them about social media and some unintended consequences of, of some of these things. But, but for the next few minutes, I just wanna challenge you with your screen time specifically. If you have uh, an iPhone and it's updated, then, then you know there's this feature on your phone called screen time. So if you go to settings and you um, scroll down a bit, you'll see screen time. And, and screen time will tell you you know, how long you've been on your phone for that day, and it'll compare it to how long you've been on your phone for that time of the day in the past, and it'll, it'll show you things like, you know, 24 minutes of productivity and 20 minutes of entertainment and 16 minutes of social networking by, you know, 10, 51 in the morning. So it'll kind of break down how you're using your phone. I, I don't know if it'll be as convicting for you as it was for me, but I way underestimated my, my screen time. And, and one of the things I would say is it's not, it's not all bad. Like, I don't want to demonize this. I, I can tell you that a lot of my screen time is I'm listening to podcasts that I know are teaching me God's word. And it'll, but it'll show you things like your notifications. The average person gets 45 notifications a day. Like, some of those notifications are good. Like, it's the Bible verse of the day is the notification. So it's not to say this is all bad, but it's to say, look, pay attention to how you're using your screen because your screen is what is discipling you. 
It's either conforming you to the pattern of this world or it's transforming you. Uh, This generation, it said, will spend close to 14 straight years um, connected to their screens. And one study showed that 68% of 18 to 34 year olds don't go one hour of their waking day without checking their phone. 74% of 18 to 34 year olds said their phone is the last thing they see before they go to sleep and the first thing they see when they wake up. I think if we were honest, a lot of us who are older would say that's probably true of me. You know, when I'm awake during the day, I doubt there's an hour that goes by where I don't check my phone. I read an article in the New York Times called, um, got my attention, Rise of the Toilet Texter. And it just said that 75% of smartphone users are on their phones while they're in the bathroom, which was interesting. But what was even more interesting is that it said that nearly 30% of Americans would not go into the bathroom without their phones. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not going in there until it recharges. I'm not gonna go in there by myself with nothing to do. And, and they won't go to the bathroom with, without their phones. And you've probably read some research about how teenagers and, and young adults, um, that they legitimately or emotionally can think of their phones not as an accessory but as an appendage. Like that's what it feels like to them. And then if you're a parent of a teenager, then you, like, you believe this because you try to take their phone away for an hour and it's like you're cutting off their arm. And, and you say to them, hey, hey, this is how all of civilization lived Always, like always, it, just I need it for an hour. And, and this is how everybody in the history of the world always lived, right? But it, it's just become a part of who we are. And one of the things I've become really convinced of is that this is not a teenage problem or a young adult problem. Uh, there are a lot of you who are in your 70s that would have numbers that compete with teenagers these days. New York Times had an article called Resist the Internet, warning us about the constant use of our devices. The author writes, they are the masters, we are not. They are built to addict us, madden us, distract us, arouse us, and deceive us. We primp and perform for them as for a lover. We surrender our privacy to their demands. We wait on tinder hooks for every like. The smartphone is in the saddle and it rides mankind. And so we stop and we ask, Am I just being conformed to this world? So why why do we struggle with this? I do think for many of us, it just snuck up on us. Like before we even realized it, we were being molded. I, I, I think if we were honest too, we would just say our screens make us feel good. We'll look at this a little bit in the next week or two, but a lot of what we have on our screens, they're designed to release like dopamine into our brains to keep us coming back. Our screens listen to us, they, they make us feel validated and that our preferences matter. They connect content and ads that we care about directly to us. A couple of years ago, one of uh, my daughters had her, her phone uh, die, battery died, and so she asked if she could use my phone, and I said sure. So she used my phone, I didn't know it. She was using my phone to shop for a prom dress. Two years later, I'm checking fantasy football scores and I've got prom dress ads popping up on, on my phone. It, it thinks that's what I wanna see and I, I, I can't, I don't know how to shut it off. I don't, know, I don't know how to get rid of it. If you need help with this, I, I, I can help. Like I feel like I'm, you know, with the styles and trends of 2020 um, <laughs> prom season. It'll surprise some of you. I, it's just, it, it knows what we want. It's constantly putting that stuff in front of us. Screens give us access to incredible amounts of information. Look, that, that's not something that's bad necessarily. Here, here's what's dangerous. It's not that we have access to information. It's that the information always has access to us. That's part of the problem. And if you think about it, isn't this how the serpent tempted Adam and Eve in the garden? Didn't? The serpent say, hey, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. You'll know what God knows, omniscient. And there's part of our fallen human nature that just wakes up when we hear that. There's more for me to know, more information, and so we constantly check and update and scroll. 
wanting to know more. And yet what we're finding is we're not, not really able to handle all of it. It's creating tons of anxiety and depression. Why? Because we are not the shepherd. We have the capacity of a sheep. And we are inundated with, with all of this, this information. And, and so I believe that God wants us to use these screens in such a way that it will draw us closer to him and closer to each other. I think there's some beautiful ways that that is happening. And I think there's some exciting ways that we can step into it as a church. So I'll give you an example. Last weekend after the sermon, um, we said, hey, we have a, a Bible reading plan that we've put up on Version on the Version app. And we asked you to, to log on to that, sign up for that Bible reading plan, go through it. It's uh, how you feeling based on the series we just did. And we had over 6,300 people sign up for the Bible reading plan on their phones or on, on their devices and have been going through that scripture reading this past week, which, which is incredible. Uh, one of the things I saw in there is that a husband tagged his wife on Facebook and, and, and said, hey, let's do this together and linked it to this Bible reading plan that we put up there. And that might seem like a small thing, but you think about what he did when he posted that. He, he's saying to his wife, hey, let's read the Bible together. He's witnessing to his friends and family that follow him on Facebook who now see that he's reading the Bible with his wife. He's making himself accountable. I mean, that's, that is an incredible way that the screen can be redeemed. And there are a lot of opportunities like that. So we're gonna talk a lot more about that in, uh, in week three. I, I wanted to finish up, though, uh, by just looking at how this ends in, in Romans 12, one and two. So do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you do this, then, here's what'll happen. You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. When you're being conformed to the pattern of this world, when you're fitting into its mold without even thinking about it, you don't, you don't mean for this to happen, but you, you run a much, you're much more likely to miss out on what God's will is for you. Like, God's trying to get your attention, make some things clear to you, but, but you're staring at the screen. And, and so what needs to happen? What, you, you need to, to break that mold so that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So one, one of the things we wanna do is that we're going to do a, um, a digital detox as a church family starting, starting tonight. So it's a seven day plan when you walked in or if you didn't get one you walked in, you can grab one when you leave. It's, it's a seven day plan, seven day digital detox that, that I, I would love to have us do as a church family. I'll say this, there's some of you kids, some of you who are teenagers, you're gonna need to be the ones to take the lead on this because your parents aren't gonna wanna do it. And you're gonna need to say to your mom and dad, no seriously, what if we did this as a family? S seven days to do this. And, and some of the challenges like Tonight, the day one challenge is, is don't pick up your phone for two hours before going to bed. And some of you are like, well, that's easy. Okay, then do it, all right? Like, <laughs> and, and then it, it builds each day, kind of builds on itself. So on day two, you'll do that, and then you'll add something. And I know there's some of you, look, I get it. Some of you have some things that have to be checked. Please understand the spirit of it, okay? We, we don't want to be legalistic about it, but... But like I said, you know, all of humanity lived this way always up until now. So, so let's lean into this a little bit. And it's going to end with a 24-hour um, screen fast on Saturday the 21st. We're just going to do this as a church family. So I'd love to challenge you to step into this and to think about what it looks like to place this on the altar before God. I really believe that if we'll break this mold that a lot of us have, not intentionally, but a lot of us have been uh, fitting into, if we start to be transformed, we'll together have a better sense of what God's will is, his plan is for our church, for our family, for our lives. So I'm asking you for this next week to be a part of this, and together, let's practice setting our screens on the altar. Let's pray. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us 
with this. I, I know that there are some people listening to this and, and they don't think it's that big of a deal, but my guess is most people understand that this has had a much bigger impact on them than they ever meant for it to. And, and so God, we spend a lot of our waking hours staring at a screen and that's not necessarily bad, but, but we need to think through it. And I pray that you would help us learn to redeem that so that we could be more closely connected to each other and more closely connected to you and what your good and pleasing and perfect will is for our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. Thank you for your grace and mercy. And so now we have the privilege of offering ourselves, all of us, on the altar as a living sacrifice. It's in your name we pray, amen.